تسعان سلستم بوغ اي اي وج توسينو تلو قابلو معالتي ايرترا لعلنة تازر رقا قصد ناتس احزاريا In 1993, a new African country was born. <laughs> Situated in the Horn of Africa, with its coast along the Red Sea, the country is very young. It acquired its independence only 20 years ago. We went to Eritrea because we wanted to know more about this country that today has some six million inhabitants. And we found a very welcoming people. The Eritreans are very warm and generous, and we saw how they are really involved in the economic and political development of their country. You know, peacefully to survive, peacefully, and to, to get uh, food, uh, adequate food for our people, uh, and we are struggling for our sovereignty. We are united. So this is the very best of our people that I see. We met members of the university and of the government as well as the Eritreans, from the diaspora who have returned to the country since its independence. And finally, we had a long discussion with the president of the state of Eritrea, Isaias Afuwoki, who modestly invited us to take tea with him. Probably people know very little. How do you make people know or how do you make people aware about the reality here? Even when there is a lot of disinformation, how do you uh, uh, tell the truth? I would have hypothetically liked to invite everyone and say seeing is believing. Come and see. <laughs> It has to be said that we did not know very much about Eritrea before. The Western media hardly ever speak about the country, and when they do, it is to denounce it as a terrible dictatorship or a bloody regime. In other words, the country has very bad press. And then make a judgment. That's a very simple thing. But can you physically do that? Can you allow everyone to come and see? 
there has to be someone who has seen with his own eyes and will have to tell the story and say this is not true. But you can't do it easily that way. We know that there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of bad news uh, uh, just spreading around the world about this country, about about its, its safety, about its uh, security, about its I don't know, just its, its political status. But that's not what it matters. What it matters is what what the people are really like. The people are not like that. The people are are not like terrorists. They're not just I don't know. They're not what what they they explain us in the news. We're different people. We love our country. We love our culture. We love our, our, our people. We respect our family, our friends, our elders. That's really hard to find abroad. People should just look at, you know, look at things in a balanced way, that not everything they read or hear about Eritrea is necessarily correct, and that Eritrea is a country that has a very, very uh, sad history of being abused and, and misused over the years. Despite that, it has managed to become an independent country. And, and, and I've come to the conclusion that don't believe the media because it's been discredited. But what the media do not say or deliberately refuse to show is that Eritrea is one of the first African countries to attain the Millennium Objectives. The Millennium Objectives were decided in September 2000 by an extraordinary assembly of the United Nations. The Millennium Summit fixed eight objectives to be reached by the year 2015. We may agree on the goals. We don't have any controversy. Goals is clean water, education, health, uh, uh, employment, opportunities, good houses, quality of life in all its uh, uh, dimensions. But uh, how do you achieve that? That's where we, we live in a world that is, is becoming very difficult. Unless you struggle and fight to achieve that, you can't uh, uh, achieve those goals without uh, changing the reality we live in, and that's where we come. The last 20 years, we have adopted a policy. We're not uh, hiring slogans. We don't need to hire slogans. Food security is the, uh, the number one priority of the country. Since it's the number one country, the resources that are allocated to food security is also great compared to uh, uh, the results as well, is, uh, a great chunk of it is earmarked to agriculture. Because of that, then uh, the problem of uh, food security from uh, year to year. Here, of course, we hope we will you know, achieve because most of the health-related development uh, goals, Millennium Development Goals, we are you know, on track, especially in uh, reducing mortality rates of infants as well as maternal mortality ratio as well as you know uh, in malaria and in vaccination in general we are you know on track as far as uh, you know in gen general speaking we have reduced sev uh, 50 percent both maternal and infant mortality at the moment you know we will achieve that one now, how do you achieve that in a, a world that is governed by injustice? For Eritrea, historically, injustice has a name. It is colonialism. First, it was colonialized by the Italians, 
from 1890 to 1941 under Mussolini, then by the British until 1952, and then the Eritreans found themselves under the Ethiopian yoke. You cannot imagine that one African nation, if at all there was a nation called Ethiopia, could colonize uh, Eritrea. It's a very long story, but to make it short, uh, yes, uh, it was colonialism by proxy. Ethiopia came into being early 19th century, early 20th century, actually, and uh, by design for colonial powers, Ethiopia was uh, selected as uh, an agent for uh, promoting uh, imperial agendas. This ideology was later on developed to uh, be called the Nixon Doctrine, where uh, imperial powers had to find agents to do their job uh, on behalf of them. And the failure comes about because uh and this is really fundamental in terms of our understanding of how culture deals with authority that is alien or authority that is superordinate, high, high authority, low people. Uh, when the pressure is too great, what they do is they go underground. They, their culture becomes a covert culture. They do not admit that it even exists. They just go on doing it without the knowledge of the authority in question. And in a way, that is the same as the camouflage behavior of weak animals in the presence of predators. They can actually disappear in the background, and uh, they're not there. They are no longer offensive, nor are they a threat. Uh, and so that's what happened. Popular resistance started in the early 1960s and it subsequently became organized under the banner of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, the EPLF. Feudal backward Ethiopia does not have the criteria of uh, a colonial power. With uh, its uh, expansionist and colonial ambitions, Ethiopia was used as an instrument uh, for American imperialist interests in Eritrea. It's, uh, it, uh, that's where the philosophy comes. It's not a uh, novel, but again, uh, uh, is it fighting militarily or going for an armed struggle and becoming independent? Or you have to take in, in, in mind uh, and build, be building a nation. PLF, I can say, was more or less a mini government because we had, uh, you know, health uh, department, which was really doing fantastic uh, work uh, during the struggle, you know, including very complicated operations. We have very meticulous uh, educational system, and uh, we had the era which was catering for people who were displaced or who pe people who were affected by, by the war. We have so many institutions, you know, uh, that uh, are typical of any uh, government for that matter. The Eritrean Liberation Front is exceptional in one particular regard. They took traditional cultures very seriously. That is to say, in order to mobilize people, you must first understand their social organization, their social structure, if they are stratified, who is on top, who is the downtrodden, uh, their economy, their customary laws, their institutions, all of that. Mm -hmm. 
but one of the positive things of the Eritrean People's Liberation Army was there was this kind of conscientization, the consciousness raising, to demystify the deep-rooted attitude that women are the child, women are, uh, could not do anything. Women can join any front if need be. That was the motto. And the men was also uh, given kind of lessons together that, yes, there is an area that they could do, but the women can also join and perform it equally. So that kind of this, uh, demystifying and consciousness raising was the basic thing. Besides, when uh, after giving the basic training, uh, when assigning people, the female and male population, have been involved in you know the activities, and uh, you know at that time we were, uh, you know, working hand in hand. You know, we were treating our uh, injury cases as well as we were treating our patients. Not only treating, but you know, given you know in the prevention aspects, so we were you know given health education, vaccination, and so on. So we were you know. But now we are the service of the population. Yes. So the result of that, it is you know, uh, we can look it at by now that we have achieved you know some of our uh, goals. What they talk about in their uh, uh, Millennium Goals has been in our program for liberation. If you go back in to see the program of the EPLF for, for, for liberation, you will have the substance of the, 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 the program is similar or more or less similar to the so-called Millennium Goals. was not only military, in fact, you know, the military is more or less uh, a follow-up of what we're doing politically, organizing the people, conscientizing the people, and at the same time uh, making sure that people realize the cause why, why, why we are fighting. In 1974, Emperor Haile Selassie was overthrown. The USSR entered into the imperialist game and supported the new Ethiopian regime. The repression of the Eritrean people toughened and became increasingly violent. But the EPLF continued the armed struggle, at the same time as maintaining its revolutionary objective, aiding curing and educating the population with a view to constructing a new society. But in 1974, uh, the, the military hunter massacred lots of people around Asmara. And the news got around very quickly, and I think that was for many including myself, it was a turning point. We became so intensely angry and so hurt that I think we just began to solidify the sense of nationhood that it became clear to us at that point that there was no way an Eritrean will ever be able to live peacefully and happily uh, under the Ethiopian domination. So, yeah, women are peaceful women are uh, peace-loving and nurturing, but if they are committed, they are committed to peace, to those who love them, to those who adore them. Soucieux de ne pas dépendre éternellement de l'aide extérieure, le FPLE a déjà atteint l'autosuffisance sur le plan médical. Il dispose déjà de nombreux cadres de valeur. Quand j'ai fini mes écoles primaires et secondaires à Addis Ababa, j'ai eu l'occasion d'avoir une bourse pour aller en Bulgarie par euh, le gouvernement éthiopien. En fait. uh -huh. Et aujourd'hui, vous vous battez contre les soviétiques Oui, oui, contre les soviétiques, contre les éthiopiens et 
ceux qui aident les, les Éthiopiens. C'est-à-dire les Soviétiques. Les Soviétiques. Uh, so many women before us as Eritrean women have joined in the Liberation Army, be it in the Vietnam, uh, Zimbabwe, in Africa, uh, South Africa also. But the difference that we as Eritrean women put was that we were in the front line. We really fought the Ethiopian soldiers. And what the Ethiopian soldiers said at that time was, God give me mercy from the Eritrean woman fighter. So this means, this means the country needed a land reform and that the exactly. other class, social exactly. class, exactly. bourgeoisie was not strong enough to make this reform and give the lands and yeah. organize and it. For the and first time, you know, the, uh, the reform was done uh, by the EPLF. Yes. And finally, after it became a government also, that kind of uh, each uh, Eritrean, every Eritrean must mm -hmm. have access to land so that... Uh, it's a land reform for justice. Exactly. À Sawa, on manie autant la pioche que la Kalashnikov, à l'image des paysans soldats de la révolution chinoise. Les Érythréens ne veulent pas être pris pour des mendiants de l'aide internationale. Il s'agit donc de cultiver la terre, d'y planter du maïs et des mangues, pour ne plus avoir un jour à tendre la main. And uh, I uh, lived in the United States for many years, teaching in universities, until 1984, when I was asked to visit the liberated zone in Eritrea, which I did do, and it was a eureka moment for me, because it transformed my life completely. By the beginning of the 1990s, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front were able to see that the end of their struggle for victory and in independence was in sight. The Ethiopian army lost control of Eritrea. But before retreating, Ethiopia launched a murderous offensive and bombarded the port city of Masawa with napalm. After their victory, the Eritreans voted for independence and elected their president. It was after 30 years of struggle that this nation was finally able to take the future into its own hands. But today, where is Eritrea at? The project has not changed. That, uh, and there was no reason for change because uh, you want freedom, you want an independent nation, and then you want to build a nation. And building a nation uh, was not consummated, would not be consummated. It only starts when you are sovereign and independent. And building a nation is not easy. It takes a very uh, long uh, process. I don't say generations, but if it's uh, uh, managed properly, it takes a long, long time. Without uh, raising the consciousness of, uh, of the population, you don't achieve any goal. Anyone who uh, has good ideas cannot uh, transform those good ideas into reality without allowing the population to participate by being aware of what it's doing. And that was a strength, and that contributed a lot to the socio-economic transformation. And then again, there has to be a vision. So 
clearly, uh, this is an extremely law-abiding nation. Now, for a nation that has fought a liberation war that lasted 30 years, fully armed, to suddenly become as peaceful a nation as we are immediately after liberation is extraordinary. Here is a nation that is really <laughs> as peaceful as it can be, despite the fact that it is a war that was, it was a nation that was ravaged by war for 40 years. So clearly, there's something indigenous, endogenous to Eritrea that allows people to say, we are a nation of laws, and the laws are ours. Hundred percent, because as I stated, uh, we were established 30 years back, and our main motto at that time was to mobilize women to participate in the liberation movement, which we achieved, and also for the development, social justice of the country, and social equality of women. This is in the process. The women's issue is not the issue of the woman alone. It is the issue of the society. And to achieve that, the uh, public, the government has to work continuously in achieving or in making a conducive environment, be it that the police have to be gender sensitive, the different programs as well as the different sectors have to have that kind of uh, uh, gender equality uh, policies and programs. If you are going to have a developed society, it's via education. Education is a tool for what we are looking for, to have a developed and equal society. What kind of education might be the issue? It has to be an education which values the culture of the people and sharing whatever you have, because at the end of the day, what you have been uh, going through education is via the people's resource. So if Eritrea is at the end of the day to have be a developed society, the female and male population have to be educated. There are areas that have never seen schools for generations and you have to go and do that elsewhere. So what we see now and how we measure our success depends on what we have done to create opportunities for citizens and all other uh, efforts in political uh, change, political transformation, political institutions is meant to serve the ultimate goal of improving the quality of life and guaranteeing citizenship. So you want to change the quality of life, you want to improve the performance uh, of, of uh, uh, the, the, the communities, institutions of government, to implement programs, you need to educate people, you need to train people. We have about uh, 700 to 800,000 enrolled in all uh, schools. When we uh, entered, uh, I mean, when well, 91, it was about 40 something or 70 maximum, probably now. It's, uh, it's gone uh, well. We're not even satisfied with that. We need to uh, uh, improve the quality. This is a, 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 a new sheet. The paste is eaten from uh, this, this part. The, the paste is eaten from this part, and uh, they be broken, and the, uh, the remain uh, part is put in the... The course we're studying is actually agricultural engineering, and uh, agricultural engineering means that uh, the use of water, land, soil, resources, how to use it for the daily activity, for our food. Uh, I mean, especially in our country, we need to supply our food. We need to secure, we have to secure the food insurance and that's, it helps us to, I don't know, use, conserve water, just the proper usage of water, land, and building dams and infrastructures that actually helps uh, the growth of agriculture, the agricultural sector. But when we compare to this plot, this plot have high nitrogen doses when compared to this. For example, this is treated with 50 kg per hectare and this is treated with 100 kg per hectare. As a result, this is very high growth 
more branches, uh, vegetative growth is more, and the yield is very high. And the production of pod is uh, very good, and quality is good, and the production is also good. And as we can see... Eritrea is a young uh, country with young institutions. Our research, extension systems, and so on, are not developed enough. And so we have a lot of challenges because uh, when you have traditional thinking in, ag in agriculture and in any area for that matter, then you have to be able to uh, replace it by advanced thinking, which means you have to have trained uh, manpower in agriculture. And so uh, this is also one of the bottlenecks apart from nature, you know, that we have to be able to uh, maximize uh, what is available. Now, since uh, the government is taking too much, uh, is putting much focus on educational sectors, uh, the government is actually trying to improve the, the, the way that the agriculture, that the farmers, I don't know, improve their farming activities. Like, for example, building dams, building reservoirs, just instead of waiting for rainfall to, to grow their crops, they, they can use irrigation, irrigation system. Because uh, with uh, the building of dams and using the dams uh, pr properly, people are now cultivating a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruits, which are also important components of food, you know. Because usually people, when they talk about food, they talk about cereals. But uh, this, uh, you know, chicken, uh, dairy, uh, horticulture, diversify. So especially with irrigation, people are really producing a lot of vegetables and fruits. Which are the infrastructure and the fishery sector was all in shambles. After independence, we started from scratch building the infrastructure and all facilities and services. And now we have about seven fish landing sites along the coast and uh, we are trying to manage to build our uh, capacity in both uh, human resources and as well as uh, infrastructure. Besides the, the coastal uh, area and island people, uh, fish is not uh, picked up by our people as a food. But now it's picking up because uh, it's been the policy of the government to distribute fish with affordable price throughout the country. We are trying to reach all corners of the country and now uh, people are uh, picking up the habit of eating fish. Uh, what we need uh, to for, as a follow-up is to teach our people how to cook and handle fish. That's in the program now. We are, uh, we are hoping uh, very much uh, first to feed our people with fish which is rich in uh, protein. So. Uh, also, we are trying to export, to increase our export capacity so that we can earn uh, as much as uh, possible foreign currency. So indirectly, it can also play in the uh, food capacity uh, achieving. achieving. eradicate poverty and food security is not uh, 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 a long-term uh, goal it's a transitional goal once we secure food then we need to go beyond that we need to export food so that we can exchange and enter into trade and investment with other people we cannot only talk about food security for us so even in the concept that have been developed within the uh, framework for uh, Millennium Development Goals, you have to be very specific and you have to know your realities. Unless you work hard towards achieving the short, medium and long-term goals, you will not go anywhere. Then again, health 
will have to be there. We have referral hospitals, but we have uh, health centers, we have uh, uh, clinics everywhere that would provide services. When you have roads, then it, it's accessible, it's easier. For those who don't have roads, that, that are, that their areas are not accessible, they are disadvantaged. And you have to design programs so as to access those areas to provide those services because you're not doing any charity work. This so is their right. This hospital it existed since 2006. Um, the hospital it started its work from way before. It was uh, in another place just above this hospital. But uh, we moved into this uh, when this new hospital was built and everybody moved here. So it started its work as of 2006. It's the general hospital for the whole region? For uh, Ginda and the subzones around Ginda. And in every part of Eritrea you have such hospitals? Yep, for every region we have one referral hospital for each Zoba and other hospitals as well. And this is a region mainly of peasants. Is it easy for them to have access to healthcare? Yes, they do. And uh, other than the hospital, we have lots of clinics, health stations and health centers in the subzobas. They have access to them and when they are referred to this hospital, they get access to this hospital. So there is really uh, health care provided for every Eritrean today? I believe. I believe so. Hmm? The government of Eritrea is committed for the well-being of uh, our citizens and we are working towards that. And, uh, um, you know, we do have a good you know system in health and of course there is an involvement of the community that is you know very important so in the hospital what we do is we, we give health education to the um, people who come here in the OPD and we try to focus on the main diseases we hear, we uh, find on the preventable ones for example we have uh, malaria case we're, if we're today is about malaria, the education we need to give, we try to tell all the symptoms about malaria, how to prevent them regarding all these um, swamps we have that they dry it, that they need to dry it, the breeding sites of mosquitoes and uh, the bed nets. We make sure that they have bed nets and we tell them if any of these symptoms appear, they need to come to the hospital as quick as possible and mostly to the children and pregnant women. I recently graduated last year, December, and as part of the um, national and community service we need to make for two years, I was uh, assigned in Genda Hospital, that's why I'm working here. Actually, you know, the Minister of Health is responsible for the health and well-being of the citizen, but we work together with our partners, with, you know, it is multi-sectoral and multi disciplinary you know approach because we are working with other ministries with our with other sectors as well with our partners health ministry it is not only supply and drug but the environmental issue comes first if there is cleanliness if there is clean water uh, you know it is a general approach so we work towards promotion of health sorry, health education and sanitation and of course, you know, environmental health in general. So we are working towards that. You only care about production, regardless of what impact it has. So what I will say is, now I think some, some countries have started to buy uh, biological, ecological, uh, some sections of the society. And this is a trend that should go. Mm -hmm. You know, people must uh, be aware of what they are eating. How is it produced? What, uh, what kind of things went into it? If you have, uh, you know, infested your, your land for 100 years using chemicals and so on and so on, do you know how many years it, it takes really to rehabilitate the land? If, you are, if at all you can do it. So sometimes it becomes too late, you know. 
we cannot really uh, abuse uh, the resources that we have and go into just productivity, productivity at whatever cost. Yes, uh, we want to increase productivity, but uh, um, uh, it must at the same time also make sure that it is healthy, that it does not affect negatively the health of our population. Whether in the fields of the environment, education, health and agriculture, with a main concern for food security, this young republic has already attained the millennium objectives well before the deadline of 2015. And 20 years after its independence, Eritrea, that used to be among the most disinherited countries of Africa, is now a sovereign nation, full of hope. By the end of our visit, we understood that most of the Western media are not saying the truth about this country. So the final question is, why are there so many media lies told about Eritrea? Quand j'entends les médias dire que l'Érythrée, c'est un pays épouvantable, qu'il n'y a aucune démocratie, ça me rappelle ce qu'ils ont déjà dit sur une série d'autres pays avant pour les diaboliser. Chaque fois qu'un gouvernement essaye de suivre une voie indépendante de la Banque mondiale, du FMI, des multinationales, chaque fois qu'il décide de servir les intérêts de son propre peuple, il va se retrouver diabolisé. On a fait ça pour Cuba, on a fait ça pour le Venezuela, on a fait ça pour la Bolivie. Tout pays qui essaye un développement indépendant et avoir son propre développement, il va se retrouver diabolisé dans les médias. Early 90s, after 91, and 93, immediately after that one year or maybe uh, two years, a World Bank delegation was here. And they said uh, they would like to write uh, us a country program a country program inclusive of uh, development programs, health, education, infrastructure, water, energy, what have you. And we said, why can't we write our program? They said, that is a norm. No one in Africa has written uh, a country program. The World Bank has the authority and it writes the program of everybody else. How can the World Bank know my needs in my house, in my country? Why now they incite and they try to create difficulties for the Eritrean government? Because for simple reason, the Eritrean project, it's not only Eritrean project, it would have been a Horn of Africa project that would have been stopped and sabotaged and Eritrean project continued in an Eritrean level. I see, as an Ethiopian, Eritrean project is not only Eritrean project. It is an African project, it is a Horn of African project, and it is a humanistic project. And so when Eritrea says we'll be self-sufficient, you know, don't look at it as, as if it's arrogance. I think this mentality from Europeans and Americans is, you're poor, you're no good, we will, you know, we will feed you. You know, that has to change. If anybody says, listen, yes, I am poor, but I want you to help me help myself, it should be respected. And I think Eritrea is that kind of the country. And that's where many of these 
conditionalities. Conditionalities from the World Bank and IMF are not conditionalities that have come from the skies. These are conditionalities dictated by special interests. One of the reasons, apart from the vision of Eritrea, Eritrea have about 1,300 kilometer coast in the Red Sea. Opposite of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, down until the Babel Mandal. Second, Eritrea have more than 300 islands. United States wants a lot of military bases. It have military bases uh, uh, in Djibouti because of its position, but also because of its resources now it is discovered in Eritrea. And having also now a lot of wells in the ground and the Indian Ocean, like a gas and oil. For these Western imperialist multinationals, they want to position themselves now in order to control these resources before the competitors can have an access or the competitor companies from Asia can have an access. Chaque fois qu'un pays est une cible des États-Unis, soit à cause de ses ressources pétrolières, énergétiques, matières premières, ou alors que c'est un pays qui occupe une position stratégique que les États-Unis veulent contrôler pour contrôler toute une région, des routes maritimes, des axes stratégiques, ce pays et ses dirigeants vont se retrouver diabolisés. Ça, ça se retrouve avant chaque guerre, avant chaque agression. Pour moi, c'est très simple. Je connais les gars, je connais eux individuellement. I at least know who pays them, how they make their earning, how they earn their living, and whom they serve. If they are coming to serve uh, Mr. Soros, that's a different story. If they're coming to serve me, serve the people in the continent, then that's another story. That, that, that's the other side of the, the story. Il y a, euh, derrière les infos qu'on nous donne, des choses qui ont été préparées préparé par des experts en communication, en anglais ça s'appelle PSYOPS, des experts en manipulation psychologique de l'opinion. Et en fait, euh, on croit qu'on reçoit comme ça des infos qui viennent juste d'un journaliste, mais euh, ce que George Soros fait, c'est qu'il finance l'International Crisis Group, Human Rights Watch, Avaz, etc. Ces gens-là diffusent des campagnes, des rapports, des informations. Et ce qui est très intéressant, c'est que dans des journaux comme Le Monde, Libération, le New York Times, euh, ou dans les grandes télés comme la BBC, TF1, etc. Ces informations sont présentées comme venant d'experts indépendants, à l'International Crisis Group, à un groupe qui euh, s'attache à la prévention des conflits. Ça a l'air magnifique. En réalité, c'est l'argent de Soros qui est derrière, mais ça, on ne va jamais le dire. Ou Human Rights Watch aussi, on ne va jamais dire que c'est l'argent de Soros derrière. Donc, en fait, ce que le lecteur, le spectateur doit absolument se rendre compte, c'est que Derrière l'info, il y a des intérêts, il y a de l'argent, et il faut toujours se demander qui m'informe et dans quel but. You repeat it again and again. I say this is uh, uh, part of the tradition they have inherited from Hitler. The propaganda machine of those systems, and particularly Hitler's propaganda machine, one of the most efficient propaganda machines. You manipulate public opinion. You even intoxicate public opinion sometimes, make people don't even question, very simple uh, uh, questions. It's illegal, it should be illegal to disinform people. It should be illegal and immoral to uh, uh, manipulate opinion. If you right. do that, then, then right. it, it's been immoral since uh, uh, millennia. The Bible doesn't allow it, the Quran does not allow it, and morality does not allow it. You can't do that. Quand les médias et les gouvernements parlent de l'Érythrée, je reconnais tous les symptômes de la préparation d'une agression. Est-ce que ça se fera par une invasion, par un coup d'État, par d'autres manœuvres de guerre civile, que sais-je euh, Ça, c'est une chose qu'on ne peut pas dire, mais je reconnais tous les symptômes de la préparation d'une agression. Et il va arriver pour le peuple d'Érythrée ce qui est arrivé en Somalie, euh, en Irak, en Afghanistan, en Libye, ce qui pourrait arriver en Syrie, ça va être la catastrophe. Ou bien on se rend compte qu'en en fait, on doit laisser les peuples décider eux-mêmes quels dirigeants ils veulent, quel système social ils veulent, à quoi ils veulent consacrer l'argent de leur richesse, 
et on doit laisser les peuples vivre en paix et se déterminer eux-mêmes sur ce qu'ils veulent. Because the majority of the Eritrean people are united toward their government and united toward their uh, uh, vision. Uh, my understanding as an Ethiopian, uh, and this, fil uh, uh, this film can contribute a lot, not only to educate and create a solidarity with the Eritrean people uh, there, but also to educate the peoples of the Horn of Africa. The project we have started in the past that it is, we the people of Horn of Africa, we are one. And we want peace. And we want bread for our people. We want also our children to go to school. We want clinics. We want our elderly people to have medicine. We want peace. We are tired. We are asking the international community, if it exists, give us a chance, give a peace. Please don't intervene in our affair. Let us alone, let us manage alone. Thank you. In front of Asmara Cathedral, we saw young Christians and Muslims dancing together, showing their joy in meeting each other and being reunited. <laughs> Eritrea is a nation on march, a multi-confessional and multicultural republic, a country from which we have a lot to learn. Shabby, shabby. 